I would like to share my screen uh, to start my my talk. So I guess everything is gonna be uh, it's gonna be okay. Um, so I, I don't know if uh, you are somehow um, starting to explore the idea of future design, but it's something that uh, working with uh, innovation, something that is starting to become like somehow uh, design thinking five or six years ago. It's like a new trend. So I would like to share with you the way I deal with this with this new approach to to innovation. And why do I do that? Because I, I don't know if you have seen this picture before. I don't know if you are a huge fan of the Games of Thrones, but this is something that I, I see in most of my of the clients I work with. Uh, someday the king arrives and asks a friend for help. In this picture we're seeing uh, Ed Stark is, uh, is talking and the king is asking for his help. Please join me, come to, to King's Landing and, let's, uh, and help me ruling uh, the world. And we all know this is not, I'm not going to spoil you uh, the show. This is something from the first book, from the first season. You know how this ends. 36 months later, this guy is uh, beheaded in front of the, of the crowd uh, because he failed. He failed with his, with his task. And, and why, why do I use the, the idea of 36 months? Because having a, a venture capital in my own company, we, we have this venture capital, we have these funds to invest in companies. When I, I receive a business plan for someone, uh, for some companies, someone who want to start a new startup, the, the average break even is in the month 36. It's amazing. I guess if you, if you left the break even, uh, for the fourth year, it's gonna, this guy is going to be scared because it's too, too much time. But if you say that you're going to break even in the year two, you're also going to be scared because, hey, these guys are going too fast. Maybe they don't know what we're talking about. So 36 months. So uh, as innovators, uh, we have this challenge. No, I think we will face this, this challenge, incorporate innovation. How might we create today? the innovation that will break even in three years and will represent a relevant source of revenues for the next five years. Because at the end of the day, all of us uh, who work with innovation, uh, who have a director, a CFO, or a CEO, or a business board, or shareholders, we need to provide results and they expect us to create benefits in a different way, to reach new targets, to reach new clients, maybe new sectors, new products, new business models. And to do that, if we were on a startup, maybe we will need five to six, maybe even eight years. So how can, can we do that? Uh, if this this uh, timeline, uh, I want to represent some kind of, of relevant uh, milestones. Uh, at the end of the 90s, McKinsey uh, shared with, with us the idea of the three Horizons, and it's something that we all work with. And then uh, five years ago, uh, maybe five, six years ago, design thinking became massive. And I, I like this idea because it's something that we, we have the chance to read in the news that IBM was starting hiring designers. So it was like, hey, what's going on? Why IBM, why are they hiring designers? And I would say that today, uh, in 2020, we are dealing with this idea of the future is something that we can design. Okay, so this is the, the idea behind, behind the, the speculative futures. So uh, I like this picture uh, because it represents two approaches to, to what's going to happen uh, with the future. So we have the idea of the rare view mirror. Uh, so forecast is the use of things that happened in the past to try to predict who's going to be the future. So in the example of the car, I will be driving and I will look back at my rear view mirror and I will think, hey, we are going to a smooth road and there is no traffic. So in the future, there's going to be a smooth road with no traffic. I know it's like an oversimplification. I totally understand that. So it's like the idea of looking back to the past to predict the future. But also it's the other idea, the idea of foresight. So we will see these mountains 
and the horizons, uh, there's snow over there, and we will say, hey, there is snowy mountains ahead, so I will need to prepare for winter weather, I'll need to maybe uh, buy this chains for my wheels, something like that. But we are driving the car, we are in the present today, and we don't know yet if we are going to these mountains or not, because maybe the road is going to take a turn and we are going to the forest. So what happens if we go to the forest with or snow chains? It's not, not going to be the best approach to be there. So this is the idea of the futures cone. This was uh, proposed uh, 15 years ago, and uh, this cone is used massively. Maybe you, you have seen that picture before. It's the idea of there are some, some futures. Um, we might pre be prepared for the future that we would like to see, and maybe we can also work in how we want this future to be and what we have to do to this future to become possible. So that's the idea with a speculative design. We want to design the future we want to see and work to increase the chances of it happening. That's okay, that's perfect. Um, it's a good idea, um, I, am, I agree with that. So that's something that I start uh, last year, I start working with my clients with these approaches for future because we already know that they need eight years to, to, to create an enduring uh, business model, a new product, a new service that ends giving relevant uh, sources. But how, how can we represent this, this idea? This is the simplest way, the easiest way to represent design. It was created uh, 15 years ago by the Design Council. It's the double diamond model. We all, we all know that. So how looks uh, the double diamond model with future design? Well, what, what we say is that in the, the phase of research, we will, we will try to identify, to identify signals, things that maybe are happening that might become relevant in the future. During the, the phase of definition, we will try to analyze these trends. We will turn signal to trends and see which of these trends are going to be massive uh, maybe in 10 years from now. So in the, in the phase of development, we will create scenarios based on those trends. Who will be society if these trends became real? Who will be business? Who will be, I don't know, uh, cities? Who will be energy if these trends became real? And then we will build prototypes. So that's it's an, a valid approach. It's based on design, something that we already familiar with. But there's, here's the problem from my point of view. So I want to start dealing with problems. The problem is what I call the two weeks fallacy. Um, I don't know if you know this, this movie, uh, The Money Pit, uh, it, starring Tom Hanks. So this, this, in this picture, Tom Hanks and, and his wife uh, buys a house and they want to do some renovations. So they hire a lot of contractors and they start destroying the house. And every time Tom Hanks asks a contractor when this is gonna end, they will say two weeks. In two weeks, this is gonna end. Of course, you already know, it doesn't end in, in two weeks. And finally, the house is fully destroyed. They lost the investment. It's a very funny picture. I like it. Uh, and reminds me that I'm not a millennial. Okay, I'm from, <laughs> from the previous generation. So um, we, we, we call this idea of, uh, of the two weeks fallacy it is, it's because we don't have certainty of what's going to happen in two weeks from now. And we see in these pictures, I don't want to talk about this coronavirus. Uh, we should be doing this talk in Barcelona, enjoying the uh, April weather in the city, but we can't because we are under an extreme, strange, uh, critical situation. But nobody foresaw this. And the guy who bought Levi Strauss, who bought this panel in Times Square, they were not aware that nobody was going to be having the chance to look for this for, for this spot, okay? So it's very difficult to, to go to someone who deals with innovation. It's very difficult if you go to your CFO or your CEO and you say, hey, I'm gonna plan for the future. I'm gonna create some scenario and we need to invest money and resources in something that we have foreseen. Okay, you know, it's, I understand it's very difficult. Um, so here is, uh, um, 
is the problem with with prediction uh, and this is a quotation from from Nassim Taleb you you can predict but you will know for sure that someone who predicts is fragile to prediction errors so if your business is doing predictions you are going to be fragile to prediction errors and I don't know if you're familiar with uh, with Taleb he's the guy who wrote this book the black swan uh, 12 years ago so he defined the black cell swan as an event with three attributes. Nothing in the past can convincingly point to its possibility. So we all think that it's not going to happen. It's impossible. Two is something that has an extreme impact. And three is something that because of our nature, we explain that uh, before it happens. So we look for data in the past and we see, hey, yes, that's the point. It was absolutely predictable, but we fail to see the reasons. Okay, so that's the way that uh, Taleb defines uh, Black Swan. And with this idea, I think that the only thing that we can be sure 100% that is going to happen in the future is another crisis. Okay, so this is something that we need to be aware that the only thing that we want, that we are able to predict, is that it's going to happen a new crisis. The future is going to be volatile. And in his next book, the book Antifragile, he defined uh, three kinds of properties, three kinds of models, systems, products, business. Those uh, fragile who suffers or even breaks uh, with volatility. Some the resilient who are able to stay the same with volatility, and those anti-fragile. So the idea of anti-fragile, uh, this, this philosopher, he says, uh, the opposite of fragile is not resilient. The opposite of fragile, something that breaks with volatility, is anti-fragile, something that is better with volatility. So considering that we are innovators and we all work with uncertainty and we are ready uh, or we need to, to know for real that it's going to be a next crisis, we don't know when, but it's going to happen, maybe it would be a good idea if we start building things with this anti-fragile approach. Why? Because uh, I like this simple uh, model, it's quite simple, but this is the idea behind uh, fragile and anti-fragile. So if we represent the gain or benefits of something, it could be an idea, a product, a system, a model, and we cross this uh, idea with these benefits with volatility. In a fragile system, potential benefits are limited. They last as long as things are stable and controlled. But we know that this is not the real life. Real, real life is not stable and remain controlled. So when crises arrive, their losses are exponential. On the contrary, uh, an anti-fragile system has maybe potential losses limited but exponential benefits. As the bigger the volatility, the bigger the benefits. So if we are living in a world that is volatile, maybe we should look for uh, creating anti-fragile uh, products, services, or ideas. So this should be the features that we need to, to find in an anti-fragile system. We need to find for something that is decentralized, distribute, redundant, um, so maybe we think that this decentralized distribute and redundant are the same, but they are not the same concept. Uh, we can have the centralized system, but not distributed systems. And we can have distributed systems that are not redundant. So this uh, set of features, also agile, the, we need to have a quick response. We need to be flexible. We need to have a purpose enduring with time. We need to be uh, stress, so we need systems to be, um, that need stressors to, to be alive, and we need to have all these redundant, distribute, and decentralized systems to be autonomous. So those should be the features of something that is ready to be better with fragility. So I'm going to share with you six tips of the way that I'm trying to use anti-fragility into uh, future design. So the first idea is that during research, I would like to look for ideas, needs, or systems, business model that remains for a long time. 
because the chances are that they will remain in the near future. So instead of looking for new things that we don't know if they're going to last or not, maybe we can also look for things that will remain in the future and use these things to build. I like this slide. It's a slide that uh, correlates uh, the production of cars and the production of bicycles. So if we need to uh, create a future with flying cars, maybe it, it was a good idea. It was a good idea in 1978 uh, because back in the time, bicycles and cars were produced maybe in the same ratio. But hey, in the in 1982, we already were producing more bikes than cars. So why are we going to, to imagine a future with flying cars? Maybe we need to imagine a future without cars with more, with more bikes, because it's what is going on. It's what we see in bikes. Are, it's, it's, it, they were invented, I don't know, in the 18th century, and we start selling bikes, okay? So maybe in the future, there are gonna be more bikes than cars. The second tip will be, during the part of, of definition, where we look for trends, we're gonna to try to identify, the, to identify those trends that show that something that it, today in the future is fragile and it's gonna break. So maybe in the future, the, these models, systems, ideas, product services are gonna be, are, are gonna disappear because they are fragile and maybe we have the chance to replace them with a better solution. So this is the idea of the end of money. Okay, I don't know if you are aware that uh, we are having more ATMs uh, each year. So the number of ATMs, a uh, uh, machine where people withdraw money is increasing steadily for the past decade. On the opposite, the number of uh, Bitcoin ATMs remains irrelevant. So maybe when we start thinking about the end of money, maybe it's not a, uh, it's not a good idea. Uh, maybe the money will end um, in a hundred years from now, but in the close in the close term, as you see, the number of ATMs is, is increasing. The third tip will be uh, to use critical thinking during the phase that we try to, to, to build solutions to avoid our selection bias. Uh, you know that in, in, in statistics, uh, selection bias uh, happens when you are not using a random or a statistical uh, good uh, sample, but instead you are choosing the sample you wanna work with. So maybe the sample is not representative enough of the society or the collective that you are studying. And, and it, it happens to you when we try to, to create solutions. And I don't know if you have been having the chance to read this, this news uh, for the past five years, but virtual reality is constantly trying to be the next big thing for the past five years, and it is not yet the next big thing. So maybe that's because we are trying to, to, to use virtual reality for things that they are not really the purpose or not mature enough. The fourth tip will be during the phase of delivery, we are all been trying to use this, uh, this lean startup approach to create hypotheses, KPIs and be able to monitoring. But the idea with anti-fragility will be, hey, it's good to have some hypotheses, but maybe you need to be constantly changing or uh, incorporating new hypotheses and new KPIs frequently. Because maybe your society and your system needs to be alive and needs to evolve. The fifth tip uh, will be during validation. Uh, use the barbell strategy that we use to invest uh, in the in the markets. So it will be something like be aggressive and also be paranoid. So instead of playing in the average, we need to play it safe in some areas and also take a lot of a small risks in others. So when we want to launch a new product for the market or we want to validate our MVP or maybe we want to validate um, a new solution, we need to play in the in the extremes instead of trying to play it, to play in the in the average. And finally, uh, the last idea is that maybe when we are learning of what happened with our solution, maybe we are obsessed trying to find what worked. And the idea with anti-fragility is, hey, we don't know what worked, but we do know what didn't. So maybe we need to invest our time in remove the things that fail 
and just consider that what worked was good to some purpose, but okay, let, let that work. So that's the, that would be the last example. We are not even in the end of cash. Cash is, is good for some purpose, and we are trying to replace cash with a lot of solutions, but these guys, uh, G4S, a company uh, who deals with, with cash, uh, with rival and deposits, they are seeing that cash is still the most widely payment instrument in the world on all continents, okay? So maybe we are not even in the end of cash. Cash is there for some, for some purpose. So uh, just uh, uh, to finish my, my talk, what I would say is that I like this quotation from Taleb. Um, when we are trying to create a future, we use the present as a baseline and we like to add new technologies just because we think they make sense. And maybe we have to do that in other ways. So this would be the, the checklist. If you want to have a checklist for the kind of uh, features that you need to look for or you need to, to, to include in your, in your solutions, in your business model, in your next innovation. If you, if you are trying to solve the problem of how might I create a business model that is gonna break even in the third year and represent a relevant source of benefits for my company in the next eight years. So that's all. Uh, thank you for your time, for your patience. I know I've been running with my presentation, but I was not really aware of your level of, of understanding or your level of practice with this idea of the future design or the idea of anti-fragility. I hope you enjoyed my talk. This is some kind of point of view that I like to, to share with you. I leave you my contact. This is my Twitter handle. You can find me on Twitter almost any time. And I'll also leave you my, my email. So Nuria, that was my talk. I don't know if everything was properly understood. Sorry for my English. I do my best. <laughs>